Okay, we might get started. It looks like the numbers are starting to stabilize. Uh, there may be a few more people that have come in in a little bit. I'd like to begin proceedings by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I am presenting, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and those emerging, and to all Indigenous and Torres Strait Islanders who might be witnessing this presentation. It really gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce and to um, both hear the presentation and hopefully uh, a nice uh, conversation afterwards with uh, Ava Castro, um, who is somebody I've known for a number of years, and I'm really pleased that we're able to present her to uh, an audience here in Melbourne and in fact internationally as well. Ava is a co-founder of Form Axioms, a research laboratory based at the Singapore University of Technology and De Design, SUTD, in Singapore, where she is a professor of practice and currently coordinates the Core Studio Number 2 and co-leads the Advanced Options Studios. She's been the director of Landscape Urbanism Unit at Tsinghua University in Beijing and a visiting professor at the Architectural Association in London, where she taught both as a diploma unit studio master and as the director of the Landscape Ur Urbanism uh, Master's Program since 2003. She's also held positions as visiting professor at Hong Kong University and honorary uh, professor at Xi'an Technical University. As a practitioner, uh, Eva is a co-founder of Plasma Studio and Ground Lab. She's been recognized with several, several awards, including the Next Generation Architects Award, the Young Architect of the Year Award, and the Contract World Award. Her work is published and exhibited uh, internationally, including Archilab's Naturalizing Architecture Exhibition and various solo exhibitions and art installations, including at the Deutsche Architectural Museum in Germany and the Architectural Association in London. Um, I know Eva from her time studying at the AA in the uh, uh, graduate program uh, with Jeff Kipnis. She was also uh, an assistant to us on the Federation Square project. Uh, so here we are uh, meeting up again. But particularly, I also know uh, Ava and her work uh, on the Xi'an International Horticulture Expo of 2011, which I got to visit and see both the uh, really large scale master plan as well as some of the buildings that were part of that exhibition. So I'm going to welcome Ava now and turn it over to her and let her share the screen and take us through her presentation. Ava, over to you. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, thank you, Melbourne. It's uh, really great to make the most out of the condition in which we all inhabit at the moment and being able of kind of getting closer to audiences and to friends uh, in this way. If nothing good about it, at least it is. So um, let me just share screen uh, so that we can get started. So I will, um, as I was telling you earlier on, um, I will go through sort of uh, six projects. Um, I believe that the six projects um, sort of contain um, sort of a similar recurrent interests throughout the work that we have been doing, but they belong, let's say, uh, to different platforms, different backgrounds, and definitely different scales. Um, if, I, if I go about this chronologically, a Plasma Studio is um, the first sort of a laboratory for architecture that, uh, that I set up. Then uh, Ground Lab um, came at a, at a second time of my life as a, as a way of kind of bridging the larger scale and the smaller scale. And it came hand in hand with my teachings at DAA. And um, in the last two years, uh, for Maxims as a kind of a full academic research laboratory uh, got initiated. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to do in here is probably to show similarities instead of uh, differences throughout the different projects, which um, sort of uh, address definitely very different scales. 
um, you need to bear with me because it's the first time that I do this lecture. So, um, um, as uh, more or less uh, explained or non-explained within, uh, within the notes that I send you, um, I, uh, I, I expect to use the words that you see now in front of all of you as a way of kind of organizing such interests and, uh, and sort of articulating how I look at the project. In that way, the project will not be looked at in super detail, but more as examples um, that characterize um, such interests. So I will kind of boringly start in a chronological order and, uh, and I will relate it to plasma, uh, which is a unique state of matter that depends on very specific external and internal conditions to arise, thus describing processes and constant transformations. Um, it's, uh, it's perhaps important to mention that um, when we got started with plasma, we didn't want to make it a self-referential um, um, office that explains who we are, but rather that stood for a mode of doing things, which we found it was very much in line to this kind of a constant fluctuations and, and transformations. Um, within, within that, or in that respect, the morphology of the iceberg is very interesting to us uh, because it is completely shaped by environmental and material processes that generate constant forces and, and, and frictions. Um, on a similar line as the iceberg, uh, we find um, that in such formations, um, there is like, a, like an incredible sublime uh, force which uh, lies uh, in its morphology, uh, the constant transformations a long time caught in space, the trace of different conditions that turn physical as an index of something else outside itself. Um, to which extent uh, the self-referentiality and introversion gives a space to a projective environment where new potentials emerge. Uh, its ephemeral uh, quality derives, of course, from a certain impossibility. Once you understand the thickness and the solidity that it has, um, and um, and this is this is sort of a this kind of a play or interplay between uh, the impossibility of uh, solids and the translucencies or almost immaterializations is something that uh, we have always been uh, very interested in. Um, this image, doubly uh, most of you uh, must know it, is uh, Ansmer Friedrich. And, um, and, and again, it comes back as, a, as the idea of the sublime to us. Um, and, and the idea of the sublime contained within, within undisclosed nature. Um, this has been a very kind of important philosophical concept uh, throughout history. And for us, we, we, we feel that it, it kind of a, it, it forms a link through criticality um, to establish kind of relationships between the social and the aesthetic practice. Um, beyond that, uh, purely at a, at a um, sort of a um, qualifying level, when we look at this image, our form of engagement is of an understanding of, of a something that lies between the discrete and the continuous. Um, if the discrete means a separate or divided and constituting a separate entity or part, uh, the continuous describes as something that occurs over space or time without interruption. Um, continuity in some ways is associated with infinity and infinitesimal. And, um, and this has been um, um, somehow an important part of our work where we have for good or maybe sometimes for bad to sort of uh, set ourselves within a dialectical position which is not only between the, the, the finite and the, and the infinite, but between the object and the context, the iconicity and the field, the diagram and the index, order and chaos, culture and artifice and nature, question mark, and, um, and mostly, for me, between the Apollonian and, and the Dionysian. Um, 
And this is something that will come back through all the scales. So I found it important to, to kind of a, sort of a wrap it as part of the overall um, kind of a conceptual understanding of our work. So I have, a, I have a, um, six projects, as I said, that I will show. And then I have what I call some seeds. Um, these are seeds um, were projects, but were projects that were kind of a very small and that allowed us to really operate in a, in a different speed and with a higher degree of experimentation. Um, these I call it seed one, let's say, of particular relevance to the projects that I will show after, and it's called uh, Chromposome. Um, Chromposome uh, was a, an installation that we got permission to do in London. And, um, and funnily enough, at one week before were starting uh, to work on it, we wouldn't know who was going to sponsor the material. So we weren't sure if we could work with metal or plastics or components or whatnot. And finally, we were given these uh, metal sheets, uh, very thin, uh, for cladding facades. And, um, and we wanted to attempt the continuous, uh, even though obviously the means to work with were these discrete components. So we, we punch press them in the pattern that you see now as to allow all possible iterations within it. Um, the folds become points of, a, or the lines become points of a weakness, which then allow us to manually deform. And, and it turned into a, a form finding exercise, if you wish, uh, where we were kind of a model making in a scale one to one. And within that kind of a model making scale one to one, let's say, uh, we, were, we were sort of uh, playing around also with the idea of dematerializing this continuity. So um, the, final, the final output was uh, continuous in macro forming or formation, let's say, but then the work of projections onto it um, brought back again the, the discrete uh, kind of a quality within it. Um, the breakthroughs, the, the, the sharp folds, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and most importantly, it helps us to discover that which we couldn't anticipate before starting to operate with the material, which in this case were this kind of a um, light through shining these uh, kind of a punch press holes. Um, so this project was happening at the same time, or maybe it was just finished by the time that, uh, that we started a project, let's call it X1. Uh, Project X1, um, right now we are still in the UK, um, and Project X1 was a um, interior design for the hotel. What you see now is the given floor plan uh, of a very, very traditional um, hotel layout. And, um, and we were allowed to do more or less whatever we wanted. And what we wanted to do is to exalt the sense of a non-familiarity that a hotel, at least in our eyes, should have. In other words, to try to break the differentiation or to establish the differentiation between what is home, what is domesticity, what is a sense of familiarity to this environment that is, uh, by definition, a kind of a temporal um, kind of a stage of our lives. Um, but we were given this uh, very discrete set of elements uh, composed by uh, columns and services and walls and sizes of rooms, which all should be kind of uh, used uh, and, and respected. So what we did is uh, to, to play in a slightly cinematic manner. We developed a set of frames um, which took the, the minimum possible allowance and the maximum possible allowance. And between these two frames, they started to shift and uh, they were codified through colors as you see it in the, in the um, below diagram. So um, to generate um, a sort of a sequence of, a, of completely um, um, 
complex geometry where um, as a user you get totally lost also because of the choice of materials and the only kind of uh, orthogonal members within the overall geometry are the given uh, doors of the, of the rooms. Um, so this, this was carried out in uh, stainless steel. Um, the idea of using stainless steel was to kind of augment that uh, reality, uh, to augment the fragmentation of these uh, triangulations and to generate an almost uh, um, sort of a, a refraction camera where you are uh, permanently lost in the moment that you reach uh, your room. Um, which, um, in other words, uh, is what we're looking at. And in there, we wanted, again, to challenge the notion of, a, of privacy within a hotel room, um, to work with transparencies, and to use these uh, transparencies as a mode of almost instigating um, a form of a wireism, if you wish, within, uh, within the room. Finally, of course, of what we always want to play with is the idea that these uh, are complex geometries and these triangulations that aim at the continuous but are, are ultimately discrete elements can produce this kind of a, um, light reflectivity that dematerializes the, the geometry in itself. Um, Probably at around a similar time, or perhaps a little bit later, um, we encounter um, this place, which is uh, Italy, and within Italy is South Tyrol, um, where our partner Ulahel um, um, works from, and uh, and we immediately um, fell in love, of course, with this kind of a type of landscape. Um, the towns uh, where we were invited to work or needed to start to develop uh, our projects were kind of uh, not very dissimilar from this one. This particular one is Dobiaco. And, um, and, um, and they're always contained within the mountains and they keep this kind of a mesmerizing relationship to the landscape, um, um, both in terms of viewing it and in terms of an altered respect towards the landscape. Unfortunately, um, this kind of uh, altered respect towards the nature has, among others, generated a type of architecture that is, uh, that, let's say, to say the least, it doesn't belong to our uh, century. Um, and, and, and it has rather become part of their imaging, or they think so. So it is, uh, you know, if you can imagine uh, pot out wooden balconies, geraniums, double peach is a typology that if it was truthful, um, you know, some hundred years ago, by now it has become a, a kind of Disney vision of, uh, of, uh, of South Tyrol. So, um, so something else came at this point in our mind because we started to, to ask ourselves, how do we relate uh, to this landscape? How do we relate um, to that which is so kind of uh, um, adored and, and respected, but uh, whose kind of development of cities and architectural morphologies do not seem in sync or establishing a relationship to it? So uh, we came across uh, this image, which uh, it's uh, taken from Titanic. Um, and it's the sequence where the iceberg hits the ship and people are kind of a puzzle at what is happening. There are bits of ice flying around like uh, some debris from outer space. And then, um, and then this kind of hermetic self-referential world of the ship is sort of uh, exposed um, to the forces of nature. Putting it actually in that moment in touch with that um, sort of a temporary context and, and setting up in a place a new, previously non-existing condition where somehow the notion of the ideal in nature is, is definitely challenged. Um, this, is, this is something that brought us to, to start thinking about the idea of nature and, and 
natural morphologies and, and to start to think about forms of inhabitable landscapes. So not, not as in nature, so in cave, but to start to think about uh, um, the, the kind of spatial uh, configurations that, uh, that kind of a rough landscapes bring, and then to start to think how they could be developed as artifices. Um, so um, this is here we come back to what I call, a, let's say, a, a seat project, one of those small things that happen maybe in a contemporary uh, mode to other kind of larger projects or experiments. And, and this was in London, um, very, very small and modest workshop where um, somehow the diversity of programs requested uh, by, the, by the client demanded to really rethink uh, problems and functions sort of out of the norm. So that what I mean by that is not any longer um, withhold um, within sort of a compartmentalized environment, given as in kind of a traditional terms in architecture, but, um, but to start to think about the effect of the skilling functions into each other. And, and, and which type of, a, of environments, as in architectural environments, could actually generate that. So, uh, <clears throat> so with this experiment, we generated our first, uh, our first landscape, let's call it in that way, um, where um, it was a continuous spiraling um, that structurally operated very well, but ultimately what it did is it produced all these kind of uh, in-between spaces uh, that were opened to be um, sort of appropriated in, in whatever way uh, the client who was an artist and tighty teacher and whatnot uh, would want to do. So this, um, this is something, let's say, uh, a learning so to call that we that we brought it forward into what I call projects uh, X two, um, which is uh, working in Italy, and, um, and and as you can see, what what we try to do is to to, to, to kind of develop a relationship to the ground where um, the surface becomes an element that unfolds from the ground. It kind of, uh, it peels the ground and in peeling the ground, it sort of uh, breaks the solidity of the ground. The relationship that is, uh, that is then set up, it's, uh, it's one of uh, um, creating a different, a different type of relationship to the, to the outside or to the landscape. Uh, which is not the one of an outsider looking at being deposited onto it, but it is more the one of a wanting um, to, 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 to challenge um, the relationship between natural and artifice. Our interiors um, have always then been designed as a transaction between the orthogonal layout towards the softer fluid morphology of the, of the roof scape in this case. Um, and our balconies are sort of in between zones that negotiate the internal rationale of uh, repetitive units um, with the, the, this kind of uh, exterior as an extension of the landscape. Um, and here um, we can see um, another image of a house we developed in there, where uh, once again, um, the, the balcony is a cut out of a structure that uh, wants to, to redesign the landscape, wants to, to set itself in relationship with the landscape as something that grows from within that kind of incredibly uh, complex uh, ground condition. Um, so now I move in time uh, and I need to move fast because I'm already halfway on my time, I just realized. And, um, and I go back to another seed. Uh, this seed was uh, the Architectural Association um, when I was studying as Don mentioned with Jeff Kipnis and Bernard Trudell. Um, this is one of the lectures that uh, Jeff did um, using some material from the project that I was working on at the time, 
which uh, is called the sports attractor. So um, the sports attractor was uh, possibly before even I knew what landscape urbanism was about, and I first sort of engaged here um, to think about the larger scale in terms of the landscape. Um, we developed a, a series of bands, which are the clearly uh, yellow bands that you see. And these uh, yellow bands were intersected by uh, blue water bodies. So essentially it was a, a grid um, that allowed us to, um, to develop a very um, a sort of a systematic positioning of different conditions. And, uh, and then those were willingly um, sort of a twisted into artificial topographies. So the, the Z dimension added to the grid a, a sort of a deformation. Where, um, where we then set up uh, what, what we call back then a, sing a single surface. And this was a, a programmatic single surface. So in other words, this was a master plan uh, for a hotel and sports um, attractor in China, um, an academic project, um, where we, we decided to not design the buildings, but to design the ground to which the buildings, any building by any developer, could belong to for as longer as our plugging was respected. So our ground conditions that dwelled into relationships of uh, extending the public into the private or uh, cross programmatic activities along the day, all of those are turned into a guideline or a set of guidelines where any developer could then um, sort of attached to it. Um, this project, um, of course, developed for me in terms of the larger scale, again, um, a sort of a um, intrinsically very important relationship between the orthogonality of the, of the grid as, the, as a cartography to control the territory and, and the adaptation of the grid to was a particular conditions within the ground or what I call uh, material resistances, which then um, generates kind of a, a more um, sort of a complex uh, environment. Um, so I will now uh, move into 2010. So um, that seed um, that I just showed you uh, was maybe a bit asleep since I um, studied at DAA and, uh, and it went into play um, more or less at this time of my life. Um, we had our office uh, by now in the UK and in Italy um, and the 2010 sort of uh, effects of the 2008 financial crash were really showing, not only in the UK, but also um, in the rest of Europe. And at that point, we got invited to do a competition in China, which is what um, uh, Dom sort of uh, talked about a moment ago. I call it uh, Y1. And, um, and it's uh, the project for Xi'an. You, uh, you can maybe see it in here. This is an aerial view of the site that uh, we had to work. It was a project of about uh, 37 hectares for the master plan, on which we had to develop um, three projects. Um, one in habitable living bridge, uh, one green house, and one Creativity Pavilion or Museum. Um, this, is, this is sort of a, what was expected in a way um, for us to do in that um, the client wanted a very strong and clear access that determined a hierarchical relationship between uh, the point of access and the final destination or one of the final destinations, which um, is this creativity pavilion. In our eyes, because that wasn't the final destination, um, it, was, it was kind of slightly pointless to think about kind of a singular gestures, but rather we were interested in developing a, um, a kind of a set of multiplicities. 
where the task from A to B is not really anymore about reaching, but it is about getting lost in all these uh, labyrinths that are formed on both sides of the axis. So the axis doesn't exist indeed anymore. It becomes a, uh, a um, densified version of the, of the overall mesh. Um, so this is, this is one of the views from the top. What you see on the right hand side is the arrival and um, mega huge uh, parking area, plaza, uh, ticketing, uh, purchase, and then this living bridge that brings into uh, the other side of the highway and uh, it sort of uh, moves towards uh, the creativity that the um, we developed, of course, what this allowed us then to do is to, to think about uh, the park as a, as a kind of a, a place uh, for making the space um, or, or place maker, rather, where all these kind of a, the small encapsulated areas were all related to different size of planting um, to generate almost like a form of navigation through, um, through, the, through the labyrinth, if you wish. This is again another top view. Um, and then what you see in the very top of it is uh, the creativity pavilion, uh, which um, this is a very, very important sort of an image for us because it was the first time where uh, me as an architect and as a partner of Plasm Studio started to work with, uh, with Ground Lab. It's the moment where Ground Lab um, got uh, initiated. Um, Ground Lab um, is, a, is a derivative, let's say, of, a, of a, some of the people that uh, were teaching together at the AA, at the Landscape Urbanism Master Program. And it was the first time that, uh, that all of us had the chance of thinking of architecture not as something that generates the ground or that relates to a given plot, but to think about built form and, uh, and let's call it for now natural form or landscape form uh, being woven into, into a third kind of architecture. Um, this became very important for us because, uh, because in a way, um, it, it was non definable anymore if, uh, if the building started to speak the language of the landscape um, or if the landscape started to develop a kind of a complete artificial morphology more related to architectural bodies. Um, and the building was then sort of a three fingers, um, schematically, diagrammatically speaking where the flows continue on both sides and through the building, producing um, sort of a, this, uh, this is sort of a, um, almost a landscape building towards the back that then becomes more radically um, solid as a building towards the, the waterfront. And, and along its kind of a in-between fingers, it produces these, uh, very narrow passages um, and, and view framings of other important parts of the park. And in that way, it, uh, it sort of uh, produces a space of its own. So the space is not anymore only what happens inside the building or what is supposed to within the walls of the building, but is the relationship between the building and the landscape what it starts to form these uh, sort of uh, public spaces. And, and, and this is something that becomes very much a uh, part of our work um, throughout uh, um, Plasma Studio and, and Ground Lab's efforts. Um, I would then shift, um, that project was in 2011, so, you know, allow me uh, for this uh, curation of the work is not completely chronological, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of kind of uh, reinventing the story of uh, relationships of the parts uh, to the whole as I go along. Um, this project is a much uh, more recent project. Uh, in fact, is a project that is currently on the standby because of all the um, COVID situation. Uh, but is an ongoing project. And um, 
and this is in Turkey. And within Turkey is in the Semir, um, close to the, to the Mediterranean Sea. And it's a project for the university campus. Again, within uh, something like uh, uh, 45 hectares or so. So, um, so in here, um, I, I started to, to work uh, um, again, like with, uh, with Xi'an, but perhaps in more detail, uh, with systems of, uh, of indexing the ground. Um, this terrain is incredibly steep in its topography, and the program is, uh, is huge for the sort of uh, usable areas, if you wish, of it. Um, we have um, 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 a full university, um, sort of a um, high school uh, to a, a kindergarten school. Uh, we have uh, um, students' residences and we also have uh, professors' residences. And, um, and it's a site that is very difficult to be appropriated. So we developed these sets of, uh, of meshes, which we call uh, the donkey path meshes. Um, to figure out the best possible paths through it, the best possible ways of developing um, kind of a, a way of, a, of, of kind of appropriating um, the ground. Um, we also um, develop a, a series of readings uh, to understand um, points of accumulation of water, areas that needed particular kind of um, work on retention walls, um, and then finally, we develop a, a set of diagrams to be able of operating with these um, very strange topographies, which is uh, essentially um, nothing too, uh, let's say, unusual uh, for architects, which is um, um, escalating, uh, terracing, and then within terracing, then how to generate within a very big mass um, light conditions and ventilation. Um, so this, uh, this diagram starts to work, to open up, to generate small uh, courtyards um, to allow for uh, porosity. Um, at the same time, these events in the original form are attributed with the uh, old program. Um, and, then, uh, and then every time that the events start to happen in order to, to adapt to the topography, is where um, the public areas started to happen, the more public areas. So what you see here, it's, uh, it's uh, one out of uh, 10 um, sort of bends, and what you see is a half of it um, in how it sort of shifts to allow for public spaces, um, walkable areas, and, and, and opening up for uh, more uh, porosity. Um, the overall, the overall then uh, plan strategy for it. Um, in here, you can see in the north the part of the university. Um, to the right hand side, you see um, the residences for the professors and staff. Um, towards the very center of the site, um, you see the the library, the main library for the university, and towards the back in here. Um, there is the, the, the primary, secondary education and um, the residences for students, both at the university and school. Um, this is um, a complete view of one of the models that we generated. And here you can see how these bands twist to accommodate to programs, to open up, to allow for um, light and ventilation, but also to generate more public spaces for, um, in reality, you move through this roof to actually enter to any of the spaces. Um, here you have uh, one of the few renderings that I will be showing because I don't really like too much renderings, but, um, but you can see that uh, this is sort of a, a terracing that dwells between existing landscape and artificial landscape or architecture becomes not only public space but the main means of a circulation through um, the overall the overall gallery so um, now I make uh, maybe another shift and, um, and 
this uh, shift brings me to Singapore. Um, both projects that you saw before uh, were developed whilst um, I was in China, where I lived for seven years. Um, but about uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was uh, um, invited to, to become a, a professor of practice at SUGD which I, I found um, to be a sort of a very interesting way of, a, of, of, kind of a, um, getting a bit out of academia and, and kind of a, a re-entering academia to kind of a, sort of a redevelop this relationship that I always had before, um, before stopping teaching at Xinhua University in Beijing. Um, and one, um, one, one of the things that, uh, that kind of, uh, we found most um, overwhelming, if you want, of Singapore, uh, overwhelming in a positive manner, is uh, its uh, geographic location, um, which, is, uh, which makes it so much part of all the countries around. And, uh, and, 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 and there is this kind of a mega blue called South of China Sea, which is, uh, which is the, the, the body that unites it all. And after, I, I don't know if uh, uh, many of you have been in China, my seven years um, in China, I lived in Beijing. Um, so for me, arriving to Singapore and encountering the ocean, um, was a, was a not only a welcoming experience of encountering humidity, uh, but also but also um, a very strong feeling of a um, of a closer contact with them um, with the climatic changes um, that that the world is uh, is experiencing. So, looking at the sea, um, of course, the question is climate. In climate, um, how how do we approach it? How to work with it? And um, and, and and remembered um, as, as kind of a set up a discourse by Deleuze and Guattari. Um, the sea is a smooth space par excellence. Um, is a uh, open water always moved by the wind, the sun, the stars, magically transversible by noise, color, and, and whatnot. Um, but um, increased navigation of the open waters kind of resulted in, a, in, in some kind of demand for its inspiration. And, um, and this took hold progressively little by little from the 1440s by, uh, um, by the Portuguese discoverers, which introduced the first nautical charts and it marked it as a, a kind of a, a turning point in, uh, in the creation of the sea, in how we read the sea. Uh, maps, the meridians, parallels, longitudes, latitudes, and, and territories created to the ocean, making distances calculable and measurable. It meant the beginning of great explorations and, um, and, and the transatlantic slave trade and expansion of the European state apparatus. And, um, and, and this to us, um, kind of a re-encountering that ocean meant uh, an incredible um, source of inspiration to start to develop a different line of work. Uh, what you see in front of you is, the, is a map of the South China Sea. Uh, which carries a tremendous strategic importance onto the fact that one third of the world's shipping passes through it, carrying over three trillion in trade each year. It contains fisheries that are crucial for the food security of millions in Southeast Asia, and it has huge oil and gas reserves believed to lie beneath the sea. Um, and this is the environment where we wanted to work, but we found it very difficult to, to relate materially to this ground, uh, given that um, it seems to be belonging to everyone, whilst to no one in a specific, all the lines kind of are cross in between 
each other. So, um, so we went back into, into our usual sort of a landscape urban using the overarching uh, methodology. Um, and, um, and we thought that, uh, that to work within this environment, uh, we needed to add one element which, uh, which I hadn't explored before with landscape urbanism, which is uh, design as a science fiction um, to generate speculative futures. Um, so in a way, um, this, this meant a sort of shift um, in, a, in my work or in the relationship with landscape urbanism within academia from material emergencies and, and tactical and to those conceptual emergencies and, and rather strategies. Um, Science is where we establish facts and fictions is where, sorry, I lost the slide. Um, sorry, science is where we establish facts and fiction is where we establish values. The name science fiction is very powerful because it seems to say we can breach the fact value conundrum. Science fiction is the realism of our time. We um, then decided that uh, in order to operate within this, uh, um, let's say, realm, we needed to also develop a different sort of a apparatus to work from within it, um, a different sort of a framework and this is how um, form axioms came about. Um, originally funded by a grant from uh, SUGD, MIT, uh, the IDC um, Center, um, and, um, and based at SUGD. Um, it, it, is, it is originally formed, co founded by me and my partner, who are both um, sort of coming from practice. Um, which uh, obviously had a, a big sort of an impact in the way in which we, we, we work and we understand the nature of the work. And, um, and in kind of a close association with the Immersive Reality Laboratory, which is a part of our team, with whom we decided to start um, sort of a experimenting with the uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, with these uh, projects, we, we have uh, been um, um, both uh, at the Lisbon Trenal and at um, the Shenzhen International Trenal exhibiting. And uh, of course, um, what we started to do is to understand um, how the Anthropocene has affected in particular realms and with particular conditions of our, our environment here within Southeast Asia. And, and, and all of these atlas of Anthropocene actions or conditions that became then um, our kind of a, how can we call it, our our palette or briefs um, to kind of work with the students. So um, questions of uh, what's the infrastructure of the future, what is the nature, what is local, what is global, um, started to find echo in uh, some readings of Erika Swingedo uh, from the post-political condition and environment, which I uh, quote. The key political question is one that centers on the question of what kind of natures we wish to inhabit, what kinds of natures we wish to preserve, to make, or if the need be to wipe off the surface of the planet, like the HIV virus, for example, and on how to get there. The fantasy of sustainability imagines the possibility of an originally fundamentally harmonious nature, one that is now out of sync with which, if properly managed, we can and have to return to by means of a series of technological, managerial, and organizational fixes. Um, with this in mind, we set up um, a sort of a, a macro, sort of a um, 
methodology to work with the students, which kind of uh, meant um, to extract a brief from our atlas of anthropocentric conditions, um, to go back into indexing uh, the macro scale and the micro scale of, uh, of the ocean in this case, and, and through infrastructure to start to think about speculative futures. So I'll go through um, this kind of already explained uh, setup. And um, it starts by looking at the macro scale and trying to map that which is invisible or at least uh, more invisible than what it was always for us to work on mappings of uh, or indexes of uh, actual ground conditions. Um, things like uh, risk maps, uh, biodiversity of ecological life and reefs, um, total bleaching, existing conditions and relationships to, um, to the currents, uh, possible routes of, a, of, a, of a shipping, existing and proposed, why not? And then um, perhaps starting to, to zoom in into particular areas to see um, to find um, um, a set of local conditions where we could start to work. In this case, this is uh, in the Philippines, is um, um, the second of our islands within this atlas that we have started to develop. And it brings us um, sort of uh, directly into um, the study of uh, infrastructures. Um, the projects utilize infrastructure and its design as the main vehicle to introduce new narratives within the territories and services. And these are gene strategies that will dwell on issues of connectivity, political, geographical adjacencies, and temporal conditions. And in that way, um, we develop um, kind of a, a serious set of studies of what it is like at an infrastructural level um, to subsist within these environments. How, um, through infrastructure, we could develop um, new ways of inhabiting the oceans and inhabiting these in-between zone of islands threatened by the um, climate changes and the ocean in itself. And then this goes always back to then um, proposing how, um, how these zones can choreograph um, through these new um, sort of uh, um, infrastructures. And, and then finally, um, we, I'll show you very kind of a quick examples of, uh, of the, um, um, the morphologies that arise from these kind of uh, fictions of inhabiting the oceans. Um, I think I think in here um, the discrete and the continuous and the relationship, uh, if not dialectic in this case, between the two of them uh, comes back as a as a mode to generate such speculations as to as to how um, relatively simple elements within such given harsh conditions could generate both uh, consistent environments at a macro scale. Um, but also um, allowing for geometric interruptions and cuts through the tissue. Um, the repetition of this kind of discrete element um, is an identity that arises from the studies of infrastructures and um, from the, the need within these fictions of inhabiting oceans and needing uh, to subsist. Um, hence, um, this sort of a machinic sort of landscapes that are developed like inhabitable islands, let's call it. Um, together with this, um, I'm reaching the end, I hope that Don is not going to kill me. Um, we, we started to work with augmented reality. Um, for us, um, initially, uh, to work with augmented reality was a, a means to to rethink um, um, the modes of representation of, of the territory and, and modes of communication um, as well within, uh, within um, kind of teams and, 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 and different um, kind of uh, um, 
workers from other disciplines. Um, but uh, what, it's, uh, what it's interesting is that um, somehow this uh, quickly translated into another, another set of interests that went uh, slightly beyond uh, purely, um, let's say, uh, representation um, kind of uh, uh, desires. And, uh, and, and it, it rather moved into thinking about modes of inhabiting um, such um, sort of fictional um, environments. And uh, in that way, we, we started to work more and more maybe with, uh, uh, with ways of, uh, of entering these spaces and, and, and kind of starting to develop uh, both together, which I think is a, a very, very dissimilar um, sort of um, um, aesthetics from what I had been working before. And, and, and concomitantly with this, I, I became the coordinator of Cold Studio 2 at SUTD, um, where I, um, I started to work with the idea of using virtual reality as a means um, not to um, sort of produce visuals, but to actually rethink the digital space, so to rethink the digital as material that um, not only is uh, to be designed or architected, but that is also uh, more and more an inhabitable space. And um, as part of this comes uh, my last project uh, with Four Maxims, um, which uh, is part of a uh, the novel ways of being. Novel ways of being is a is a national gallery's uh, initiative um, to call for uh, rethinking um, what is the, the the status of artist, art art production at large, digital art, and the relationship of both to the public and to the museum as a viewing platform within this, um, this moment of the, of the uh, pandemia and the, and the um, kind of a lockout. So um, what our proposal is uh, um, very much working uh, within an um, interdisciplinary collaborative team um, to generate a skeleton for a collaborative authorship, um, which is then shared with overseas curatorial teams and, and, and them choosing an artist of their choice. And the idea is to create new digital creative worlds. So through this collaboration, we seek to open new imaginaries surrounding art infrastructures in the digital age. Um, this is a project that is co-curated by Formaxiums, my partner Federico Roberto and myself, and Intermission, Uri Hulao and uh, Johan Jo. Um, but it's got a huge amount of people working with us, and on the list, the five artists that we see on the left-hand side, um, and, and the five uh, foreign curators that we hope we're working, as well as a uh, writer and contributor Rafi and um, currency design as our media partner. Um, within, within such a context, uh, Negantropic Fields, uh, which is our, our, our project, um, has been developed as a, as a project that focuses, as I said before, the work of five specific artists with responses of other five international uh, curators. Um, the, the digital platform uh, will incorporate um, such virtual environments and translations of the archaeology um, that give uh, birth to the, to the artwork of these artists. And um, um, we, we suppose that the current paradigm shift exposes such necessity to imagine new emancipatory practices for non-physical forms of creation, mediation, and exposure for the navigation and the manipulation of abstract uh, materials. Um, 
um, the project will be made out of uh, three parts. The first part is a web slate, which you can already visit, but it is still kind of uh, being developed. Um, in this website, we would expose the conversations with the artists, the curatorial practice as a form of generating um, an archaeology of art. A second part, uh, which would be then engaging um, kind of a foreign um, respondents and generating a second iteration of works as a kind of establishing dialogue with the local artists. And uh, finally, the third stage group, which will take physically at the uh, National Gallery, where we will um, set up a uh, sort of a, the physical, um, say, the materialization of this archaeology, this kind of uh, different parts, both in the form of digital media um, and virtual reality. And with this, I uh, hope I finish a bit late, but I do finish my. Uh, um, conversation with you. Um, hopefully, having made it sort of semi-explicit, this idea of the practice as a, as a mode of plotting uh, constantly new fields, uh, in my case, within plasma phenomena and formalisms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you. First, thank you very much for taking us through basically about 20 years of work. Uh, which is fantastic to see and to to see the developments of it. Uh, and then, you know, the new work that's coming out of your presence at uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and, sorry, my phone just went off. Um, but I wanted to start with, uh, uh, I mean, particularly up until pretty much the very last components, um, there, there's a there's a really strong thread that that runs through your work and is still present even in the the, the work in the South China Sea, um, which is this um, this look at the 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 question of surface of a kind of single surface that in one hand is a horizontal surface which becomes a vertical surface, on the one hand it's a uh, uh, a sort of tectonic surface but then it's also a landscape surface. And you talk about, you know, obviously the work that, that you helped develop at the Architectural Association with Landscape Ar Urbanism, the unit there. But I'm curious if, 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 it, if, if there's a uh, genesis, so to speak. I mean, if it comes from the tectonic and then becomes seen as the landscape or whether it's really understanding the landscape and realizing that that sort of continuousness of surface becomes part of it. Because it's interesting between, you know, some of the early work, both with the graduate school with Kipnis, but also the work, for instance, in both in London with the, the hotel and in, in Italy and in, in the Tyrol. You know, these are very small projects. And then the next ones are really huge. There's, there's, there's not a lot of in between, you know, most architects would have done sort of buildings and schools and maybe a museum or stuff, but you go from almost interior to 37 hectares. And, and yet there's some, some continuity to that. So I'm interested in, in where that sense of continuousness comes through in, in, in your work. Um, I think there are like, a, like always a, kind of a, lots of different um, answers to these. Um, if I was to trace where the interest for the continuity, continuity got started, probably I would go back to the sports attractor, mm -hmm. <clears throat> where the surface as material surface um, ended up becoming continuous discontinuous, but what was important was the continuity of the programmatic activities. That which back then we call continuous surface or single surface, I remember, you know, initiated by Alejandro, Fashid, you know, we were all talking about single surface. Um, but in our case, we were very proud of saying that we were not necessarily buying into the physical articulation of the single surface, but we were interested in the, in the political um, um, 
sort of translation of what that single surface meant, and hence we translated it into kind of a discontinuum of a, a public spaces that erupted into um, any form of private hotels or other type of activities. So it was essentially, um, for me at least within the team, um, a means of understanding continuity as a, as a way of generating new, new affiliations, new relationships, new social forms of engagements, getting out of the norm of what kind of a compartmentalized activities and behavior. So, um, so I think that that um, was uh, in the way that we used to work. Um, it was very abstract, and it was maybe not too immediate to understand what it meant or to translate it into into the work of plasma. Um, so, so in a way, with plasma, um, it started from the other end. It started from at the end of um, of discovering complex geometries. Um, wanting to work in, in a very, um, perhaps initially, a very intuitive manner. Um, and, then, and then whilst working with it, starting to understand, and the silversmith is a very good example of that, of how um, material surfaces and programmatic uh, surfaces sort of uh, necessarily come together or could come together into generating new forms of even developing your work. Um, and this, this, became, this became more or less a, a line of interest and a line of research that we, that we followed up through. What we understood very quickly, and I think it was because um, when we started Plasma Studio, we hadn't won any competition. We, we started it right away with, with the first commission that came from the sky, whatever. So, um, very quickly, we understood that the continuous in kind of construction terms didn't really exist, uh, but you were always kind of attached to material constraints and to kind of uh, factory sizes. Um, so, so for us, that sort of a negotiation that in between wanting to achieve a kind of continuous complexity and spilling activities. Um, while using discrete elements, it's very much what made us um, start working with planar surfaces and, um, and, um, and, and triangulations or kind of a folds versus many of our colleagues back then that were working with splines and kind of curves and, mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, this, I mean, of course, I didn't show today for the sake of time, any in-between projects. So of course we had some possibility of bridging the scales in between uh, X1 and 2 and, and Y1 and 2. Um, but, uh, but, but essentially um, it is academia uh, teaching at landscape urbanism what uh, made that sort of a jump of scales and materials into, into a synthesis that made it possible to continue to be consistent, even though operating within, I don't know, 37 plus hectares. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, just to, just for the audience, by all means, if you have some questions, please use the Q&A function to uh, send us through some questions and we'll try to get through those. But I want to go back. I mean, again, you brought it up and, and you do have a, a sort of uh, trajectory that kind of goes in and out between practice and academia and then practice and then academia and now you're professor of practice in academia and you talk a lot about the this role of research so i wonder if you could say a little bit more about how you see research if research is uh employed in order to deal with a specific uh, uh condition specific topic, specific uh, 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 conundrum, as you called it earlier, or if there's research and then at some point it gets utilized. So it's a kind of before or after condition with research. I, um, I think in my case, it varies. Um, if, I, if I go back to my years of teaching at the AA, um, my position within my practice was, uh, was very strong 
and was a very um, kind of a determining of issues that I was interested to, to explore. So in a way, um, the loop um, whilst in the UK was very much um, from um, necessities within practice to then kind of uh, explore within, within academia. At least uh, it was so while teaching a diploma unit. Um, when we started to, to teach in a um, landscape urbanism, that that supposed a really kind of a huge change of scale, then, then this kind of a turn around. Then it was more like a, um, I always felt that the works within academia, um, they, they are never completely finalized. Uh, because uh, because you have only a certain amount of time to develop them and then you explore different directions and within the UK back then we always explored through the lenses of the students mm. so I, I, I in that case academia became for me a source of new interest to then further develop in a more singular manner and in more detail within the practice. Mm. Um, now, that completely got reverted um, during the last years in China. One, because I stopped teaching, but two, because as, as you well know, um, the speed of, a, of development in China and the speed of doing projects is so horrifyingly fast that there is no time to do research. So, so I, I, I felt, I started to feel a bit um, hungry for getting back into academia. And, um, and since in Singapore, this kind of relationship has again reverted a bit because, uh, because it's, really, it's really how we have processed uh, global conditions through this particular geographic location, which has a uh, brought us to, to initiate this kind of a new leg, let's say, of interest, um, which um, at the moment, uh, they have not gone back to the ground lab or plasma, uh, but they are kind of uh, continue to be explored in this uh, very nice kind of uh, in-between stage uh, of, of the projects that we are doing here. Yeah, very good. I'm going to read, there's a, it's not really a question per se, it's more of a kind of comment, but I think you could react to it uh, because it applies to particularly the projects, the more recent projects in the South China Sea. It says, it's from Ian from sustainabilitycycle.com. Uh, Thank you for the fantastic visual lecture. I'm in agriculture and your tools could be applied to integrating photovoltaics, hydroponics, aquaculture and greenhouses in sustainable infrastructures on islands that are going to be hit during the coming depression due to tourism reduction. Augmented reality would enable islands uh, to see the energy and water harvested that can sustain their communities and the integration of hydroponics, agricultural drive driven by photovoltaics and supplying jobs to the community. So, I mean, be interested in some of the, the research you have been doing with the students at SUTD in terms of the kind of implications of the, the research that you've been developing and the, the, the look, the sort of deep look. I mean, again, a kind of indexical looking at uh, the islands in the South China Sea. Um, this is this is exactly uh, what what we are doing at the moment. So basically, um, the general the general narrative is uh, we are interested in the coastal areas and island conditions within Southeast Asia, and um, and and we are particularly interested in the ones that are more um, threatened to disappear or at least to kind of minimize their current form of a, of a living of the, the, the kind of local communities. Uh, so um, so this, is, this is one reason why we focus on infrastructure. So infrastructure for us is, uh, yes, is uh, energy generation, um, you know, from uh, photovoltaic energy uh, to kind of uh, uh, 
tight uh, energy production, uh, going through windmills, you name it. Um, but also in forms of subsistence within kind of aquatic environments. So uh, uh, fish culture, floating aquaculture, um, um, kind of a, a verticalized forms of hydroponics. And, uh, and we are developing like a, a incredible sort of an in-depth catalog of such infrastructures. And, and it is such infrastructures, the ones that then um, sort of uh, arise um, into, into a form of architectural identity to the projects. So, to, so the projects that we are developing, they're unapologetically machinic. But that not to say that they don't have a kind of a, a you know, they don't look like a factory, obviously. But, uh, but we are interested in that sort of a conversion of a, um, infrastructure as a traditional typology into a kind of a hybrid infrastructure as a, as a kind of prototype. And, and how that prototypology can then be something that, um, that generates an identity of its own. And in the, I mean, again, I was taken that, uh, particularly with the, the projects in the South China Sea, uh, the, again, there's a very strong utilization of index or indexification. And that runs all the way back to uh, the projects at the AA with Kipnis and with uh, Baharam Shadal. Where do you see that fit? Because again, you know, in the work of Alejandro, uh, there's a lot of uh, referencing to indexification, mm -hmm. some of the work of UN Studio, obviously. Um, and I, I wonder, again, when you're talking on the one hand about continuities, is indexing also a kind of stratification? That is, it's kind of taking things apart into constituent uh, identities, which is less about the kind of chaotic mix of, of, of continuities and, and flows and so on and so forth. So just curious relative to the, to the more recent work that you've done, whether you see any limitations or ways to kind of bridge the, both the specificity and the uh, comprehensiveness, you might say, of a situation. Yeah, uh, well, that, I think that goes back um, a little bit to the beginning of the lecture, or sort of the beginning of the lecture, where um, we were talking about the discrete and the continuous, and, and this is sort of a set of dialectical mm. relationships that we that we develop. And, and to be honest with you, I don't I don't really think we set up these dialectic relationships, um, you know, on the onset of starting to work. But somehow um, they started to to derive as a as a questions from the work in itself as we were going. And um, what, what we, we, we kind of uh, soon um, sort of realized or understood is that um, whilst working indexically, and, uh, and this is maybe um, something quite uh, related as well to the project of Heinzmann um, of the hyperindex, is that uh, somehow um, the, the, the sort of a, the, the, the procedural way of working through indexicality seems to bring you to a um, to, to think about architectural formations or let's call it spatial articulations that seem to be subdued within that information. In other words, it, it, it seems that they respond more to the field condition than um, to their own kind of body as an unfolding a form of iconicity. And, um, and this is something that we have, um, we have, we have sort of uh, um, struggled through um, because, uh, because um, um, at, at times we have generated forms of architecture that seems to, to kind of uh, disappear within the landscape. And, and at times that wasn't really what we were after, or maybe it took us to make some mistakes to understand that that wasn't what we were after. Um, and, and, and I think uh, I, 
This is why I always defended the kind of a bottom up, a top down way of working. So for me, the, the indexical, the existing information, the existing material resistance within any environment are belonging to the bottom up forces and to the, into the processes related to indexing those forces. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that there is a, a conversation or a dialogue between those and, and the top down agency of the designer as a critical thinker as a, as, a, as a cultural producer, or I don't know, as we were calling before, perhaps as, a, as an agent of chaos, that, that determines up to what point you, you let that percolate. Um, that conversation that happens between, uh, between the existing and, and the bottom up and the top down is what I think it can, it can generate uh, more of a of a hyper-indexical model, one that, uh, that kind of uh, goes beyond the, the kind of managerial uh, um, kind of an enterprise of resources, let's say. It's interesting, last night we had a, uh, a presentation as part of this series, an extension of this series called uh, MSD at Home, Melbourne Speaks, where one of our uh, professors, uh, Professor Helen Frischaux, gave a talk about her work. And her work is really, or at least the talk last night, was about infrastructure and infrastructural love. Um, and so this question of infrastructure, I'm interested because towards the end of your talk, you also talked about infrastructure, particularly in the work with the South China Seas. But you also talked about uh, nature or natures with a plural, which I think is really important that it has that S at the end. So I'm curious, and given you know your own uh, statement about that the current developments have this kind of machinic quality, where in that work it, can you just can you differentiate or describe a little bit more what you mean by natures and and how that fits into both infrastructure and the kind of machinic uh, analysis and and research that you've been doing? Um, I um, yeah. So I think. Uh, um, Maybe that uh, um, that interest in nature, that reading of nature, starts with a, maybe Eisner's uh, Friedrich's uh, painting, and the understanding of a, uh, you know, the, the 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 sublime on that. It's not what you consume of the kind of a contemplative sort of a nature or landscapes, so, but it's actually at undisclosed in nature that is uh, violent, um, mm. active, incredibly responsive, and, um, and in that particular painting, a nature that, uh, that to me would not have existed without the submarine that mm. crashes it against it and, and kind of uh, generates this, uh, this, this momentum, let's mm. say, mm. right? Um, and then this, this is something that carries because uh, when we design, um, you know, we, we kind of geometrize uh, uh, landscapes uh, to the point that they look like a, um, legs of buildings, let's say, but we also um, maybe landscape, landscape size of buildings in a way that they kind of uh, dilute within the ground. Um, so so, so this, this was carried through and, um, and it became more of a political question um, when, when we started to, to read, read uh, Eric uh, Sundeldom's uh, kind of uh, uh, comments on nature and, um, and, and probably became more um, sort of uh, relevant even for me um, on the, the current sort of demands for so-called sustainability. Mm -hmm. you know? As if, uh, as if the world thinks that there is something called benevolent nature that awaits for us to kind of uh, be restituted um, mm -hmm. somehow. Um, so, so, um, so I think uh, the, 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 our relationship in the work towards nature is one, and, and, and funnily enough, sorry, is the same one that we started to discover in the architectural scale in South Tyrol. 
because the relationship to nature that, that interests me is not the ones of, of the one of a submissive adoration or kind of a respect per se, but is the one of establishing some form of, of symbiotic kind of a assimilation where you know human nature is uh, is, is is sort of um, posing questions and, and to 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 the external nature. Mm -hmm. So in in the work of the South China Sea, it's uh, it's particularly important because all the projects are reactive towards a threat, mm -hmm. um, and in being reactive towards a threat, they they all propose. Um, a new narrative worlds or new um, kind of a fictions, sometimes dystopian, sometimes utopian ones, but always where the positioning of the designer and, and the environment that we may inhabit is dependent on nature. Mm -hmm. and, and, but but, it, but in, a, in, a, in a kind of a new setup along, along productivity. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure if that answers kind yeah. of a fully no, no. the question. Look, we're 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 just about out of time, but I've got one more question here that somebody sent in. So I'd like to see if you can respond to it. Maybe quick response, but 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 take what it, take what it needs. It says, "Can you please help me to understand how you establish the middle ground between such dualities like order and chaos that you mentioned? Is it a segment?" of the process or a solid conclusion that's generated as a result of the dialogue? Does that question make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think is the, is the later, is, uh -huh. uh, is, uh, is, uh, is something that materializes out of, uh, out of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it's also important to say that the dialogue doesn't happen only internally to myself but it's a dialogue i have always worked with other other people in teams mm -hmm. so it's a is a dialogue that happens uh, sometimes at a three-party manner sometimes two-party manner and be between these kind of relationships so um to me uh, the, the 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 diagrams that derived from the sports attractor uh where the the, the kind of contained greed uh, that, that determines positions that calculates, uh, you know, in a cartographic manner the territory, and the subversion of that same greed through um, setting up a, 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 an intensification of the Z axis. It's it's what generates that conversation, that dialogue between the two of them, and is and is a is a diagram of through which we have sort of a continued to work always. Mm -hmm. Great. Listen, we're going to have to stop there. Uh, yeah. We've taken up a lot of your time and we very much appreciate your making yourself available from Singapore to us here in Melbourne. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Ava, for showing us your work and giving us some insights into both how you work, but also where your trajectory is going nowadays. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the MSD at home, thank you again and uh, good evening. Good evening to you. Thank you very much. Always lovely to see you, Dom. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.